live another day, come across another proposed diagnosis, another clinical entity. There was a guy about a thousand years ago, or 800 years ago, his name was uh, Occam, and there's Occam's razor, which says that a proliferation of entities indicates bed science. I wonder what this tells us about clinical or abnormal psychology. <laughs> At any rate, I've contributed my share to this proliferation. Uh, most recent contribution is covert borderline. Prior to that, somatic narcissists, uh, cerebral narcissists, inverted narcissists, and your name, called empathy, and you name it. So I don't feel shy about my um, participation in this marathon. And today we're going to discuss yet another proposed way to pathologize you and your relationship. And this is relationship obsessive compulsive disorder. Yes, you heard it well. Relationship obsessive compulsive disorder <laughs> or ROCD for, for, for short. Acronyms are a big thing in psychology because they confuse laymen and make us feel superior. Okay, Shoshanim. ROCD, Relationship Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, is, as the name implies, an obsessive compulsive disorder, shockingly. But it's focused on intimate relationships in several ways, which I will detail a bit later. Like every other obsession compulsion, it's very debilitating. It has very negative impacts, not only on the relationship, but on life in general. These are thoughts, images, urges that are intrusive. They are unwanted. There's distress. There's interference with life that is experienced as um, an enemy within. It's kind of an attack on, on values and, and welfare and well-being and benefits and good feeling. Intrusive thoughts are followed usually by compulsive behaviors. These compulsive behaviors are rituals. They are supposed to neutralize the catastrophized fear, feared consequence of the intrusive thought. It's, it's a form of self-administered anxiolytic. The ritual, which is a behavior, reduces the anxiety which is attendant upon the intrusive thought. When the individual tries to suppress or neutralize obsessions, ironically, they increase. Um, the frequency and the distress only increases. So obsession compulsion feeds on itself. There's an intrusive thought, an anxiety-reducing ritual, but it only enhances the intrusive thoughts or at least the potency of the intrusive thoughts. So there are many types of obsessions. You know, there's germophobes, people who are terrified of contaminations and germs, uh, fears about harming oneself and others, doubts, compulsive neatness and orderliness, you know, Hercule Poirot, Hercule Poirot, anyone who has seen the series, religious obsessions, sexual obsessions, um, Obsessions are everywhere. Obsession is simply a dysfunctional pattern of coping with catastrophizing cognitions. And so it's easy to believe that there are obsessions related to relationships, past relationships and present relationships. It's a, re it's a series of repetitive and intrusive thoughts about how you feel about relationships in general and how you feel about your partner in particular, in different relational uh, contexts. It could be parent-child, it could be romantic relationship, intimate partner, a committed relationship of, of some, some sort. These are unwanted, intrusive, chronic and disabling thoughts. Relationship, obsessive, compulsive disorder. I'm going to describe it in broad strokes, broad brush strokes, and then I'm going to delve deeper. So those of you who just want the, the overview can stop after, I, after a while uh, when I begin to delve much deeper into the clinical manifestations of this obsession compulsion. 
obsession, obsessions and compulsions that have to do with relationships are naturally centered on relationships. People doubt. These are doubts, self-doubting, continuous questioning, hypervigilance, which is self-directed, suspiciousness and even paranoid ideation, which actually is self-directed or partner-directed. People doubt whether they love their partner, whether their relationship is the right relationship, whether their partner loves them. And when they love, they this kind of people with this kind of obsession compulsion constantly check, reassure themselves that this is the right feeling. They may even engage in abuse in order to test the partner's resilience, commitment, and unconditional love. When they attempt to end the relationship, they're overwhelmed by anxiety. They stay in the relationship, but it doesn't help the anxiety. They're haunted by continuous doubts, and so the anxiety only increases. It, they're between a rock and a hard place. They can't terminate the relationship because of the overwhelming abandonment anxiety, and they can't stay in the relationship because of the relationship obsession, obsessive compulsive disorder. Another form of ROCD includes um, preoccupation, checking, reassurance seeking behaviors related to the partner's perceived shortcomings, flaws, frailties, vulnerabilities, misconduct. Instead of finding good in the partner, this kind of obsessive compulsive people constantly focus on what's wrong with the partner. They exaggerate these, these flaws. They use them to prove that the relationship is fundamentally bad because the partner is fundamentally wrong for them. And the fact that they are not able to concentrate on anything except how unworthy the partner is and what a bad choice it had been to be with this partner. They focus only on, on this. It, it causes them enormous anxiety. And of course, it, it undermines the intimacy and the relationship itself. Partner-focused ROCD symptoms occur not only with intimate partners. They occur between parent and child, for example. The parent is overwhelmed. The parent is preoccupied with the idea that the child is not something, is not I don't know, good looking, is not sex socially competent, is not moral, is not emotionally balanced, is antisocial or sick somehow. And this obsession is immediately leads to compulsion. And the compulsion in this case is increased parental stress, low, low mood, low depression, low level depression, dysthymia, and control freakery. This kind of parents attempt to control what they perceive to be the negative aspects and dimensions in their children. And like all other forms of OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, there are probably psychological factors at play and biological factors at play. No one really knows. There are maladaptive ways of thinking and behaving, and that's why CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, is very effective. Uh, but it's not, we don't know we guess, we think that there are also genetic, um, neurological and, and biological aspects to OCD because we know that medication works, reduces OCD. And medication, of course, operates on the body, not the mind. Over-reliance on, over -reliance on intimate relationships um, also plays a role. When you're dependent on, on the other person to regulate your sense of self-worth or self-esteem or to regulate your moods and your emotions when the other person becomes an external regulator, when the value of the partner um, is disproportionate because the partner is in control of your inner landscape, of course this creates an enormous fear of abandonment. This is part of attachment theory. And it increases vulnerability. And just being aware of how dependent you are and how vulnerable you are to being rejected and abandoned, just being aware of that produces the anxiety that could lead to compulsion. And the anxiety translates into intrusive thoughts. This is very common, for example, 
in borderline personality disorder. Cognitive behavioral therapies are the gold standard for, for talk therapy for OCD, although we usually also use medication. According to CBT models, we all have actually unwanted intrusive thoughts, images and urges, automatic negative thoughts, ants. But individuals with OCD interpret these intrusive experiences as meaning something bad, as, as leading to something bad. The intrusive thoughts are perceived as self-critical. They prove to the person that he is, I don't know, crazy or, or bad or something wrong with his character. Or the intrusive thoughts predict, pro prognosticate some horrible future, a catastrophe is going to happen. So this is a process of catastrophizing. The core of OCD is, um, is not the intrusive thoughts, which, as I just said, all of us have, but the way the OCD person reacts to the intrusive thoughts. Um, a mere occurrence, a mere happenstance of an unwanted thought about a loved one having the, the accident, an accident, for example. Take this. We all have this. We all worry whether a loved one could have an accident. But the obsessive person reacts to it in two ways. First of all, the mere thought of an accident renders the accident very probable, plausible. This is magical thinking. And the second reaction is the self-critical. I must be a bad person if I'm thinking of an accident. I must want the accident, actually. It's a manifestation of an unconscious wish for something bad to happen to my partner. And these interpretations increase attention to these unwanted intrusive experiences because then they are coupled with emotions, negative affectivity, and it makes them much more distressing. Then the frequency becomes out of control. It, the, the thoughts proliferate. And so the individual tries to control these thoughts, tries to neutralize them tries to repress the content. And so he, he develops rituals like, I don't know, washing hands, uh, counting every second tile on the floor, checking things all the time. Did I lock the door? Avoidance, suppression of these thoughts and mental and behavioral rituals, which are known as compulsions. These controls, these attempt to control, they, they don't work. That's the core issue in OCD. The solution that the OCD person comes with, these rituals, these compulsions, is a bad idea. It's a dysfunctional solution because it actually enhances the anxiety. The very attempt to control the thought, of course, brings the thought to consciousness, amplifies the thought. <laughs> if you have an intrusive thought and you pay no attention to it, it goes away. But if you then panic, and try to control the thought, it metamorphosizes and takes over you. It, 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 it becomes you. And so, um, according to CBT models, the problem with, with people with OCD is that they give negative interpretations to these intrusive experiences because they have, they hold negative automatic thoughts, maladaptive, maladaptive beliefs, about themselves and about the world in general. They perceive the world as hostile. They believe that if anything bad happens, it's their own fault. This is called inflated responsibility. And so people with OCD, um, when they have such a thought, they want to cleanse themselves. So they would wash their hands. Um, and it translates. Very often there is a displace, displacement of the thought. So there is a thought my partner may have an accident and then, oh my God, I'm a bad person because I want my partner to have an accident. And then this is repressed because it's too much to cope with. And then there's a displaced, a, a substitute thought. I'm contaminated, I'm dirty, I should wash my hands. And they do this in order to avoid feeling the responsibility for hurting someone. It's very infantile, it's magical thinking. It's the underlying belief, the hidden assumption that your thoughts have effects, immediate effects on the environment and on others, physical effects. In relationship obsessive compulsive disorder, 
the intrusive thoughts, intrusions, are about the rightness of the relationship, the suitability of the relationship partner. The partner is not smart, not moral, not good-looking enough, will cheat. This is very distressing. And so to reduce the distress, individuals with ROCD equally apply all kinds of ritual. They try to get reassurance from others that the partner or the relationship is good enough. They test the partner or they check the perceived flaw. They may look for information on the internet. How do I know if I'm the, on the, in the right relationship? Or they assess their physical reaction and feelings towards the partner, for example, during sex. They're constantly on the lookout. They're constantly supervising, monitoring, looking from above. It's like an out-of-body experience. They are, in other words, depersonalizing. And in this sense, obsession compulsion is dissociative. It's closely associated with dissociation. We are beginning to realize that only very, very recently, in the vast majority of universities in the world, they don't teach this because this is very current knowledge. The connection between dissociation and OCD is very, is cutting edge, is bleeding edge knowledge. There are similar behaviors that increase the attention giving, uh, given to the intrusion. They give it more importance. They make it more frequent. In a way, you could perceive, we could perceive of OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, as a way to cope with dissociation. The intrusive thoughts are very terrifying. They're very threatening. They're ominous. The immediate reaction is dissociation, to forget these thoughts, amnesia. And then there's the ritual. And the ritual is intended to um, actually restore the attention given to the intrusive thoughts in order to eradicate and eliminate it. So there's a battle between dissociative repressive mechanisms on the one hand and a desperate attempt to eliminate or eradicate the negative thought via behaviors. Individuals with relationship obsessive compulsive disorder also give catastrophic meaning to meanings to intrusions. It's, it's, these are maladaptive beliefs. Uh, for example, they can, they, they can develop the belief that being in a relationship they're not absolutely sure about always would lead to an extreme disaster. For example, cheating. And these beliefs lead individuals to interpret common relationship doubts in a catastrophic way, provoking compulsive mental acts and behaviors. Um, focusing on the partner like a laser beam, but the opposite of love bombing. I would call it flow bombing or negative bombing or shortcomings bombing. The repeated assessment of the strength and quality of one's feelings towards the partner in a negative light. The treatment of, of these symptoms, of course, requires psychoeducation about the disorder, CBT, exposure, therapy, response prevention, and, and so on and so forth. And so people have bought into this clinical entity, new clinical entity. There are even apps <laughs> developed to assist therapies um, coping with these maladaptive beliefs. Okay, that's the overview of the relationship obsessive compulsive disorder and here some of you may check out for those of you who are interested in deeper clinical in a deeper clinical picture um, stay tuned for the following so relationship obsessive compulsive disorder rocd are obsessive compulsive symptoms that focus on intimate relationships i said it before i would refer you to two uh, articles, which are ex an excellent introduction. The one, the first one is by Doron G, Doron Guy, Derby D, and Svepsenvol, Jesus Christ, Svepsenvol or something. It was published in 2014. It's titled Relationship Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, a Conceptual Framework. It was published in the Journal of Obsessive Compulsive and Related Disorders, Volume 3. The same guy, Guy Doron, uh, and, and the same guys actually, Guy Doron and Danny Derby wrote something a lot more popular and published it in the OCD journal, in the fall edition of the OCD uh, newsletter. I'm sorry, the fall edition of the OCD newsletter. And the article is simply titled Relationship 
OCD. So everything I'm, I'm, I will say now is based on their excellent work, groundbreaking, um, groundbreaking work. So as, as we said, relationship OCD focuses on relationships. Could be child-parent, could be intimate relationships. And when you go to OCD forums and help groups, it's a very common topic. And it's beginning to infiltrate somehow uh, the media. O this form of OCD is especially distressing because it's personal and interpersonal in relationships. It impairs functioning in interpersonal relationships, at work, study, family, but also with oneself. And people have doubts about suitability of partners. People have doubts about relationships. It's totally normal. There's ups and downs. There are, there is always ambivalence, changeable or opposing feelings towards a romantic partner. That's completely natural. It's actually part of developing intimacy. Overcoming this ambivalence is a very crucial part of developing attachment, bonding, and intimacy. We all pay more attention to our partner's real or imagined flaws as intimate, intimate relationships progress because naturally, we are, the more time we spend with a partner, the more we are exposed to the negative aspects of his existence. At the beginning, he puts his best foot forward. There's a lot of play acting in initial dating. But intimacy means that you're free to show your vulnerabilities and your less positive sides to your partner. But with some people, the minute they're exposed to the shortcomings and frailties and vulnerabilities and brokenness of the partner, the minute they're exposed, they begin to catastrophize. Their doubts and concerns, their worries become impairing, time-consuming, distressing, intrusive. They overtake everything else. People presenting with ROCD notice these symptoms early on in early adulthood, even adolescence, because that's when they begin to develop intimacy in relationships. And it's a lifelong thing and it affects all, all relationships, especially romantic relationships. The first time this kind of person faces important romantic decisions, girlf become girlfriend with someone, getting married, having children, these this crit critical junctures, these passages, as she he called them, they provoke anxiety. And this anxiety is all pervasive and all permeating. And it gives rise in an attempt to rationalize the anxiety, in an attempt to make sense of this anxiety. The person develops these intrusive thoughts and the dysfunctional rituals, the behaviors, which are intended to neutralize and suppress these thoughts. ROCD symptoms are not limited to ongoing romantic relationships. There could be an obsession about the past. I think that retroactive jealousy is a form of ROCD. It causes people to avoid entering relationships because of the anxiety and pain associated with past relationships. ROCD symptoms are not related to relationship length or even to gender. It's, it's gender neutral. They've been linked to other significant personal difficulties. For example, people with mood disorders, anxiety disorders, and of course, other OCD symptoms, not relationship related. They tend to develop ROCD, relationship related OCD. When there, when there are difficulties in the couple, sexual dissatisfaction, uh, extramarital affairs, problems with the relationship. In some people, this triggers an OCD response. Our OCD is not linked to other forms of OCD. A person can have multiple forms of OCD, including our OCD. People with other forms of OCD and people with non-known OCD diagnosis so show similar levels of interference in functioning, distress, resistance attempts, and degree of perceived control, 
due to symptoms of ROCD. So ROCD can attack anyone. You don't need to have OCD in order to have ROCD. You can be a victim of ROCD. And, and ROCD is as disabling as other types of OCD. It's a really bad thing. And as Doron and Allies, Derby and others say, ROCD has two common presentations, relationship-centered and partner-focused. The symptoms are grouped, coalesce into these two groups. And so people with relationship-centered obsession feel overwhelmed by doubts and worries, focused on their own feelings towards the partner, their partner's feelings towards them, and the rightness of the relationship experience. They ask themselves, is this the right relationship for me? This is not real love. Do I feel right? Does my partner really love me? Etc. Etc. So they are relationship focused. They are systemic. They have systemic OCD. The OCD is about the system, not about a specific individual or occurrence or event or behavior, but about generally about whether I should be with this person. And the people who are partner focused, they have partner-focused obsession. They focus on the partner's physical features. They could say his nose is too big, her boobs are too small, or whatever. They focus on the partner's social qualities. He is not sociable. She doesn't have what it, take to, what it takes to succeed in life, etc. Or they focus on personality attributes. She is immoral. She can't be trusted. She is not intelligent enough, or she is not emotionally stable. So relationship-centered and partner-focused symptoms can happen at the same time and very often reinforce each other. Many people describe being preoccupied with a perceived flaw or problem with a partner, for example, body proportions, but then much later, they begin to doubt the whole relationship. They're plagued by, by skepticism about the whole, the whole thing. Some people start with doubts about the relationship and end up preoccupied with the, with the flaws of the partner, but that's more rare. So what does it look like? What are, what are the presenting sim symptoms and signs in clinical settings? Well, there's, of course, obsessive preoccupation, doubts, a variety of compulsive behaviors intended to reduce feelings of uncertainty, anxiety, and distress, or reduce the frequency of such thoughts. So, but the compulsions in ROCD are idiosyncratic. They are special to ROCD. They are not common to all to other OCD man, um, uh, manifestations. So, for example, monitoring, monitoring and checking their own feelings. These people keep asking themselves: Do I feel love? Do I want this partner? Do I want to be with her? Did I ever love her? Am I going to love her um, if, given the opportunity or time? Should I invest in her, etc.? And then there's doubts about behaviors. Am I looking at others? Do I have a wandering eye? And then the, the obsessive thoughts, intrusive thoughts. Do I have critical thoughts about her? Do I have doubts about, about him, etc.? So these people are immersed in their own mind, constantly um, trying to ascertain what is the level of doubt and suspicion regarding the partner. They keep comparing their relationships with other people's relationships, friends, colleagues, characters in romantic films, TV sitcoms, and celebrities. They make desperate attempts, these people, people with relationship uh, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, they make desperate attempts to recall good experience, experiences with the partner. Times when they felt when they, they felt sure about the partner. And they keep consulting, and I mean like daily and hours every day, friends, family, therapists, fortune tellers, psychics, you name it, about the relationship. They keep buttonholing um, um, everyone who passes, asking questions about the relationship. People with ROCD try to avoid situations that trigger unwanted thoughts uh, and doubts. They may avoid specific social situations, such as friends they consider uh, to be very much uh, in love um, or having a perfect relationship. So if they, if they have friends 
whose relationships are, are good or who are in the throes of a love affair with someone, infatuation or limerence, they would avoid these friends because these friends trigger, remind them of what they are missing and may provoke a cycle of obsession compulsion. They avoid particular leisure activities, such as seeing romantic movies, uh, um, because they are afraid that they would not be able to feel strong or passionate love as the characters in the movie do. People with ROCD may give great importance to romantic relationships. In a way, ROCD reflects an overinvestment, over cathexis in romantic relationships because the functions of the romantic relationship in people with OCD, ROCD, are not the same as in healthy people. The romantic relationship with people with ROCD is an anxiolytic mechanism or device. The idea is that a romantic relationship can reduce your anxiety and depression. It's a salve, a medication. They self-medicate with intimate partners and they outsource internal ego boundary functions and regulatory functions to the intimate partners. So the romantic relationship has an inordinate importance in the life of the person with ROCD. Negative events relating to these relationships cause significant distress, make them doubt their own uh, self-worth and go into panic mode because they're about to lose regulation, functions, their inner landscape is at risk of disintegrating. And people with partner-focused obsessions are particularly sensitive to the way the, the partner compares them with others and to the way others look at the partner. Situations where the partner is viewed unfavorably or when encountering alternative um, potential partners cause intense distress and trigger this preoccup compulsive preoccupation, com obsessive compulsive preoccupation. Now, people with ROCD have extreme beliefs about relationships. They have a very unrealistic perception of intimacy, of relationships and, and what they should and could get from them. Uh, it makes them more responsive and emotionally reactive to relationship concerns and doubts. These beliefs are counterfactual, and some of them are catastrophized beliefs. The terrible, uh, irreversible consequences of being in the wrong relationship. The hurt. This is a form of hurt aversion. So a belief like romantic relationship that doesn't always feel right is probably a destructive relationship. Or I think breaking up with my partner is one of the worst things that can happen to me. Or the thought of going through life without a partner scares me to death. These are all dysfunctional, uh, negative beliefs. Of course, they're all wrong. Extreme beliefs about love make people with ROCD more vulnerable to negative relationship thoughts or emotions. So this kind of beliefs, if the relationship is not completely perfect, it is unlikely to be true love. If you doubt your love for your partner, it is likely it is not the right relationship and not the right partner and probably not love. If you don't think about your partner all the time, she's probably not the one. And similar to other forms of OCD, beliefs about the importance of thoughts, generally the importance of these thoughts. If I think about it, it must mean something. Or even if I think about it, it will, it will come true, magical thinking. There's a difficulty with certainty, inability to handle certain uncertainty, I'm sorry. An inflated sense of responsibility. It's like, if I fail to prevent something bad from happening, I might as well have caused it. I made it happen. And this also increases sensitivity to ROCD. Now we treat ROCD the way we treat OCD with, with CBT and so on and so forth. But it's, it's at its infancy. People with OCD in general, and relationship OCD in particular, find great relief in reading or hearing about someone going what, through what they are experiencing. So joining forums may be a good idea. And reading or even listening to this video may be a good idea. And definitely CBT would be a good idea. The treatment includes assessment, information gathering, mapping the symptoms. And there's an understanding forming a, with, a, between therapist and client about beliefs and views of the self and others which may be affected by the symptoms, wrong thinking. 
and uh, exposure and response prevention prevention therapies ERP therapies are also very very good there's also there are also new techniques like imagination based exposures and so on so there are treatments and there are treatment gains there are effective strategies there are relapse prevention plans OCD is amenable to treatment unlike for example narcissistic personality disorder let alone psychopathy so go for it go treat yourself the worst case you will be given medication antidepressants and anxiolytics in the worst case even some stimulants amphetamines may be of help just go and take care of this if relationship obsessive compulsive disorders has taken has taken over your mind is disabling you paralyzing you and ruining your relationship you may wish to take care of it you may wish to tr to have yourself treated because it can be different and it can be better.